Welcome, everybody. I'd like to invite David Rizek, who's uh, the Chief Scientific Officer, who's going to be talking with us. Uh, top five interventional cardiology trials of the past year. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. So I took a little, a little bit of liberty on this talk, and instead of just the top five trials, I, I named this the most, the top trials that influenced my practice. Because after all, if it is a great trial, it should influence your practice. Now, number one on the list has to be the Absorb Two trial four-year data. The rationale for BVS, as you know, is if the stent disappears, the problems with long-term DES disappear. In over four years, this is the first case we did in Scottsdale, you can see what happens, the, the scaffold completely melts. Now the problem is that between the implant and three years, TLF and stent thrombosis appeared to be unacceptably high. However, between three and four years, once the scaffold had completely disappeared, stent thrombosis and TLF of the BVS arm were identical to Zions. You see in these graphs at about 1,200 days, the lines are flat between Absorb and Zions. No new TLF. And the same held true. There were new, no new scaffold thromboses between three and four years. So the concept remains intact. However, the take home message is this is a first generation bulky device in need of iterative modifications. What has been proposed is a 50% reduction in resorption time and technique matters. The PSP technique matters. Consider the following. Why is it that the same six guys make it to the World Series of Poker Finals in Las Vegas each year? It must be that they're the luckiest six card players in the world. Or is Texas Hold'em uh, actually a skill game? Similarly, why do we have a number of centers that adopted the PSP technique and they have no stent thromboses, including our own program? Is it possible that PCI is also a skill game? The bottom line to this trial and many of the other trials I'm going to show you is that technique matters. Let's look at another one that I think affects our practice, and that is the DK Crush 5 trial. This was a randomized trial in unprotected left main patients of DK crust versus provisional stenting. Nearly 500 patients randomized one to one. All of these patients had true bifurcation left main disease, and here you see the primary endpoints of the study. DK crush stenting significantly reduced the incidence of one year TLF compared with provisional stenting. And the one year reduction in TLF was primarily driven by fewer target vessel MIs and TLR events, and the reduction in TVMI with DK crush was driven by a reduction in lower definite and probable stent thrombosis. And it did not matter whether these were simple left mains as seen to the left or complex left mains, TLF was reduced with the DK crush technique as compared to the provisional approach. Now, it's very important to point out that the reduction in TLR had nothing to do with success in the main branch, but the ostium of the side branch, the daughter circumflex vessel, where most of the instant restenosis were seen. In other words, once again, an unprotected left main coronary intervention technique matters. Let's talk about the Syntax 2 trial. The management of left main disease and three vessel disease is driven mostly by an aging study, the Syntax-1 trial. There have been technical and procedural advances, new risk stratification tools since then, modern gen DES, invasive physiologic assessment, high-res imaging such as uh, OCT and IVIS, and improved CTO technique. Do these developments over the last decade affect the outcomes? The comparator arm for Syntax-2 was the PCI and cabbage arm of similar patients in Syntax-1. These were matched patients. So let's talk about what was the impact of intracoronary physiology. Nearly one-third of the patients had their PCI deferred. They didn't have significant disease. It reduced the number of lesions treated per patient, and it reduced the number of cases with functionally significant three-vessel disease. What was the effect of hybrid CTO technique? Only 50% of the patients had successful PCI of a CTO in Syntax-1. That number nearly doubled in Syntax-2, and therefore modern hybrid technique really does work. What was the impact of IVIS? Stents per patient, stents per lesion, mean stent length, and total stent length 
were all affected by high-res invasive imaging. Now let's compare the PCI arm of Syntax-1 to Syntax-2. 17% of the patients in Syntax-1 had a major adverse event, only 10% of the patients in Syntax-2. Very different uh, outcomes in terms of modern generation technique. All-cause death was numerically favored in Syntax-2, myocardial infarction, repeat revascularization, and definite stent thrombosis all favored modern generation technique. And when the PCI arm of Syntax-2 was compared to the cabbage arm of Syntax-1, there was non-inferiority. The bottom line, once again, technique matters, and the other bottom line is equipoise will always favor the less invasive procedure. Let's look at the senior trial now that examined the effect of tailored DAP duration in what was to be essentially high bleeding risk patients, those over 75 years of age. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to Synergy or best-in-class BMS. If the patient had stable angina, they received one month of dual antiplatelet therapy and then monotherapy thereafter, and if they had ACS, they received six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. MACE favored drug-eluting stents over best-in-class bare metal stents driven by ischemic-driven TLR, and the stent thrombosis rate in the Synergy arm after cessation of DAP was better than the bare metal stent arm. I think this is very revealing data, and this has been the springboard for a number of abbreviated DAP trials that have gone to the FDA. The bottom line on bare metal stents and abbreviated DAPT is made bare metal stents, now rest in peace. I don't think there's any role for bare metal stents anymore after this and other trials. The COMPASS trial examined patients with stable coronary and peripheral disease and randomized them to several different arms, aspirin, rivaroxaban, or combination therapy. Low-dose combination therapy reduced ischemic MACE, it came at the cost of major bleeding, however, but there was a net clinical benefit. The bottom line, we need to tailor this therapy and individualize it. Culprit shock looked at those patients who had multivessel disease and cardiogenic shock in the setting of STEMI. 700 patients were randomized to PCI of culprit lesion only versus immediate multivessel PCI with the endpoints being renal failure and death. The composite of death and renal failure favored culprit vessel only PCI, the relative risk of death favored culprit vessel only PCI, and renal replacement in these patients favored culprit vessel only PCI. Once again, the bottom line when performing STEMI PCI and cardiogenic shock Technique and judgment matter. Finally, the VEST trial showed that wearing a life vest within seven days of an acute myocardial infarction with a reduced DF did not change the three-month outcome of mortality. There was an inexplicable all-cause mortality benefit, and so the authors concluded that despite the fact this was a negative trial, that it might still be of benefit. I think most reviewers saw this as resoundingly negative. The bottom line to all of these data sets, which I have shown, in complex intervention, technique and judgment trump all other considerations. Duane, I'd like to ask a question of you. I, I called this the top, uh, this is called the top five trials. I changed it to those that impacted my practice. I actually showed seven trials, but interestingly, in my practice, anyway, the Orbita trial did not strike into the, into the top trials. Do you agree with me or disagree with me? Uh, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with you in that we spend an excessive amount of time talking about Orbita. It, I mean, it, it has its place and its importance, but as far as impact on my practice, each and every one of these affected me as soon as they came out, and uh, Orbita did not. And as you know, the patients are also voting after Orbita, 87% of them want to have PCI because their symptoms were... I thought it was like, just you know. too small of a trial. Courage had 10 times the number of patients trying to answer at least a similar uh, type of question. I just thought it was too small of a trial uh, for, for an endpoint of its magnitude. Yeah, and, and then maybe in a larger comment, I'm really proud of our uh, specialty because each year you think, well, what else is there to figure out, you know? And, we're constantly, we have ways to guide our practice. And each year, you know, there's more for us to guide our practice. And some, 
you know, uh, are valiant attempts that don't impact our practice. But uh, each and every one of these are things where we're figuring out what to do. And I'm really proud of us as a, as a group and, uh, and with all of our partners trying to figure these things out because I don't think very many other uh, uh, specialties in medicine can do what we've been doing. Tim, you got an opinion? So I uh, completely agree. It's a great list. And uh, first of all, regarding Orbita, I think the biggest thing is uh, coronary disease is not a six-week disease. And uh, so I think, uh, and it's really a, it's a sign of social media because clearly it dominated social media. Right. But I, I think too, I'd like to just point out too that I think are really, for me, really important. I think the DK Crush trial was an incredibly important trial for left main stinting and technique. And uh, so I really I like how you summarize that. The second one that you did short, I think, is the first trial in a series of trials which will change the way we do cardiogenic shock. And so I think culprit shock uh, is the first step in us really making a difference. Um, it showed that you can do a trial like this, but uh, I'm not sure the conclusions are where we will be in three years. Because um, what for people who know, half of the people in the trial had out-of-hospital cardiac arrest as well. That clearly changes the outcomes if you're in a cardiogenic shock trial, whether you have arrest or not. Number two, very low use of in, in the trial, less than 10% use of radio, and less than 10% use of uh, uh, perfusion devices. So it's an interesting shock trial. It's great that we got it done, but it's first step. Right. I hope we're going to stay on time, so I'm going to step down. We have to go another minute. Go okay. Ahead. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. good. Um, as a, as a uh, general non-invasive cardiologist, it's fun to have the opportunity to say that I also agree the Orbita trial was not impactful. Great. It, it demonstrated things that we already knew. The Courage trial demonstrated that there's a benefit in terms of symptoms, functional status, health-related quality of life with PCI for the first three months, and then with medical therapy, it catches up. So if you're a patient who would like to go forward with an intervention to have an improvement more rapidly, you should have PCI. If you're someone who would rather avoid a procedure and uh, would favor medications, I worked in the VA for five years. A good proportion of those patients had severe PTSD, and the idea of laying on a table was not favorable to them, and so they opted for medications. These are things that we already knew, and Orbita essentially demonstrated that once again. I think the thing that did this a disservice was the way the popular press jumped on this, but I think some of the editorial uh, editorials that came out were a little over the top as well. So how does our surgeon uh, feel about us pressure wiring blood vessels and figuring out a third of the time that, uh, that uh, we don't have three vessel disease? Yeah, I think it's very interesting, and we wonder what to do when we get that information from a cardiac surgical perspective, because our guidelines still suggest that even moderate disease, anything over an angiographic 50% stenosis is probably still worth bypassing. But surgery is so much more invasive that we don't want to have to miss things, and the, I, we think that this incremental risk that adding an additional bypass graft, for example, is, is a lot lower than it is in other settings. So, we're interested to see how those, uh, that information is going to progress to coronary bypass surgery as well. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Manos Berlakis, uh, Professor Berlakis, uh, who uh, is at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. And, and I, I want to commend you, too, on an awesome meeting. This has been great. But uh, you're going to be talking with us about the five most anticipated interventional trials for the year ahead. Welcome, Manos. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bain. And again, thank you all. And, and thanks for a great panel. I had the great opportunity last night to learn this topic. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud couldn't make it, so at 1 a.m. I had the opportunity to look at the most anticipated uh, interventional trials. So I might be a little confounded because I had several glasses of iced tea. So you know, you might have the judgment might not be the best. So, but how do you talk about the anticipated trials and how do you find what's going on? And that's word of mouth. So I asked a few people, but you know, at 1 a.m. it's hard to get really informed opinions. The other way to do this is to go on clinicaltrials.gov and actually uh, scroll out studies that are ongoing or f uh, finishing up right now. And actually, if you've got coronary interventions, there's about 147 studies. So I had a lot of learning last night. And this is what I found and what I think is going to be the most uh, anticipated trials for the next year. Um, this is um, on the culprit shock. Remember, culprit shock was published at DCT, presented at DCT last year, published in New England. It shows that if you have a cardiogenic shock, Essentially, we should only fix the culprit lesion, because if you do immediate multivessel PCI, you're going to have more death and more renal failure. But the question comes, what's, what should we do in people who have ACS but do not have cardiogenic shock? And the study called COMPLETE. 
should be finished in the next year. And this is a 4,000 patient study that takes people with STEMI who undergo successful primary PCI, and then within uh, 70, uh, 72 hours, the uh, randomized to either get complete revascularization or treat them with medical therapy alone, follow up for a mean of four years, and then the primary endpoint is a clinical endpoint of death MI with a primary endpoint of death uh, MI and uh, uh, ischemia-driven revascularization. So this study is going to tell us whether the culprit shock applies to uh, people who have a STEMI but are successfully treated and are uh, hemodynamically stable, doing well within three days their primary PCI. So this is coming up soon. Number two. This actually I put in because in the shock session yesterday, we had an excellent presentation from Naveen Kapoor, and people were just uh, um, super excited about this. Now, this may or may not pan out, but for those of you who were in the shock session, there was a debate between Hari Naidu and uh, Naveen Kapoor about whether the door to balloon is obsolete and now we should be replaced by the door to unloading, meaning that you come for a STEMI, forget the culprit artery, what you should do is put them on uh, some, th some way to unload their ventricle, instead of decreasing, in, increasing the myocardial supply, decrease their demand, and maybe that's better because you might reduce the damage, and as a result, the long-term problems with large area of myocardial infarction and the need for uh, um, ventricular support therapies, VADs, and other problems. And there is actually a lot of work that uh, uh, Naveen has done showing that with unloading in animal models, you do have actually better protection and less myocardium dying. So this study is a fascinating study. The enrollment is completed. It's 50 patients who have anterior STEMI, and they're um, randomized I mean, uh, to either get a All of them get unloading immediately. So they go to the lab, and they get an impeller impella device. And then one group, you wait for 30 minutes, and then two primary PCI. And in the other group, you uh, do immediately the PCI the same way we would do right now. Um, of course, Naveen was describing his experience early on, which is obviously very stressful. We never used to be in the cath lab with a STEMI pace and then waiting for 30 minutes to open the artery. I mean, that's a pretty stressful experience, as you can imagine. But uh, the study is completed. Uh, probably won't be ready for TCT by Miami American Heart. So although it's a small study, nothing like the other American trials, I think mechanistically is very interesting to me because it completely changes the paradigm of how we're going to treat STEMI in the cath lab. Number three. You know, some of the challenges that we have in um, PCI have to do with um, severe calcification. And I'll actually show you some of the products I think are going to be popular in the next year. But calcification is bad because you cannot assess the lesion very well, hard to get stents there, and also hard to expand the stents, so you have higher risk for restenosis and stent thrombosis as well. And the largest study done to date on this is the Rotaxus trial. It's been now several years that this was been done. It was only 240 patients. So we're treating essentially a very large subgroup of lesions with a study with 240 patients that didn't show any significant benefit with rotational atherectomy, but did show that you have more stent loss if you don't do atherectomy up front. So the next study that's coming, it may not be ready until late, even late next year or the year after, but it's the Eclipse trial, we may have seen, which is the largest study ever done in severely calcified lesions. 2,000 patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one to orbital atherectomy versus angioplasty, with the primary point being a clinical endpoint of uh, target vessel failure. So this study will give us much more information. Should we be doing upfront atherectomy? What are the benefits, risks? What is the crossover age? So highly anticipated study. I think it's about a quarter enrolled, but enrollment is really accelerating right now. Number four. This actually was going to be presented at European Heart in about um, uh, a month from now. And this is a very large trial called the Leaders Free Trial. Um, I'm sorry, it was the, it's the, it's the global leaders presented, but builds on the stand that was used in the leaders free trial. That study was presented a couple of years ago, ago at TCT, and that's the one study that showed that if you use a, a drug eluting versus bare metal stand in high risk for bleeding patients, and you give everyone only one month of DAPT, most people were using bare metal because saying, well, bare metal is going to be safer. It was actually the exact opposite. The drug eluting stent had significantly lower incidence of cardiac death, MI, and stent thrombosis. And um, as a result, of changing the way we think about how to approach these uh, high risk bleeding patients. And actually, that created much less incentive for using bare metal stents. So I'm biased about this, but I think vein graft is the only area where you can put bare metal stents. Maybe we can debate this later on. So the global leader study is going to be presented um, next month. It's a 16,000 patient study that essentially is looking at the impact of aspirin. 
So aspirin has been, of course, a class one indication for many years. It's cheap. It's effective in the early studies, but now we do have some better antiplatelet agents. And the question this is trying to answer is that if we um, drop the aspirin early on, so the one arm, you get ticagrelor for 24 months and aspirin for just one month, and then stop aspirin beyond ticagrelor. In the other arm, you do your standard 12 months of DAPT with um, aspirin and ticagrelor clopidogrel, and then you continue with only aspirin afterwards. And the primary endpoint is the two-year composite all of all cause mortality and non-QF myocardial infarction. So massive study completely changes the paradigm in terms of antiplatelet therapy for patients who um, have ACS or acute or uh, stable angina, and we're very excited to see how that goes. And number five, which actually is very similar to this study, also has to do with aspirin, dropping it early on. But this is a different flavor. This is Roxana Meran study, that the Twilight trial, which what it's doing is, is using ticagrelor for three months together with aspirin, but then one arm, you drop the aspirin. In the other arm, you continue um, dual antiplatelet therapy for the first year. This is about a year out, but also will try make us understand which way is better. Do we need aspirin, or is it time to get rid of aspirin? Now, there are many questions, bleeding, cost, that have to be sorted out. But in terms of science, these are some of the exciting studies going ahead. There are many other things going on. Probably will be in a longer time frame the next year. You know, FAME3 is going on. The ischemia trial. There's the hybrid trial. Um, there's another study of radial versus thermal versus STEMI. But these are going to be at a longer time horizon. But I'll also take a few minutes about the three products I think are going to be the most anticipated for the next year. The first one in my mind is having a good cover stand. The one worst thing you have is a perforation, and nothing is going to go down. As you know, in the United States, we only have the graft master right now, which is better than nothing. But to deliver it in calcified lesions, it's very difficult. Well, the good news are, I mean, hopefully, in the next year, we're going to have the papyrus, which is a single stand with a, um, a PTFE membrane versus two stands, much more deliverable. As speaking to Europeans and Canadians, it's a great, much better stand. So I'm the most excited about this device for next year. The next one has to do with uh, lithoplasty. Calcified lesions remain a problem. This device, there's a disrupt CAD study that um, uh, actually will publish a circulation soon, showing that you can treat 50 people with very high success rates and very low of complication and very, very easy. You put a balloon, press a button, and that can dilate very calcified lesions. So we're looking forward to this. And the third one, which is actually imminent, is going to be available uh, in the next few months, is the Sion Black. This is a polymer jacketed wire. And for CT operators, one of the ta uh, tasks that, that are hard is getting through septal collaterals or very tortuous collaterals. And this wire is what is used in Europe routinely and has the best characteristics, replaces field RFC, replaces Whisper uh, with a composite core technology. So to summarize, the five studies I think are going to uh, be the most anticipated have to do with management of uh, ACS, the complete trial in terms of what to stand, the door to unloading. Uh, for complex lesions, calcified lesion eclipse, and then uh, for pharmacotherapy, the study is looking at ticagrelor alone versus aspirin and see how that pans out. So thank you very much. Uh, Manos, great list. Uh, great list for creation at 1 o'clock in the morning, too. Uh, that's amazing. Um, you know, uh, I'm really excited about the uh, Naveen's door to unloading trial, but I do think somewhere within us as interventional cardiologists, we do know that door to balloon times really don't apply to people in cardiogenic shock. I mean, the difference between a door to balloon time of 95 minutes and 85 minutes when someone's been sitting around at home for four hours already to begin with and then is in shock, somehow I really uh, agree that it doesn't make any sense. But that is separate from the question of whether unloading itself is the answer. But, but these are not shock. These are people without shock. These are people with yeah. standard anterior yeah. MI. Yeah. And instead of opening the artery, which would dip, you just put them on loading first. So yeah. it's a little different question, but I agree with you. It's, uh, many people have concerns in terms of feasibility, bleeding, large sheath bores in people that we you know, have a, a lot of 2B3A sometimes and intensive endoplatelet yeah. therapy. Yeah. And one other trial I might offer for our consideration is complete. Uh, looking at whether complete revascularization in the, the STEMI population is, is the right thing to do or not. Okay. But that's the number one. Yeah. Oh, wait, did I not hear it? <laughs> uh, okay, all right.
Sorry, I wasn't no, listening. No, perfect. <laughs> so just a couple comments to follow up. I, I guess that's my concern about the D2 unloading trial is that, um, and we'll talk about it in innovations in STEMI coming up, is, is it too, uh, will it be sick enough population that you actually can test what you're trying to test? So that's my concern about that. I, I think Eclipse is a really important trial, and for those of you that are participating out there, what I would really encourage you is enroll everybody. Enroll in this trial, because we really need to know the answer to this uh, study. Um, and you know, where we are, we know calcium is important, but we do not have a trial that shows that making a difference uh, with um, any, with rotoblader or any other device now makes it, and this trial is critically important. But it's not just enroll, it's enroll everybody, you say. Enroll everybody. Because if enroll, you enroll the ones where you, you think there's equipoise, exactly. it's a bias toward to That's enroll. critically important if you don't enroll consistently all your patients with calcium. So I think that's a really important thing. And then I think Twilight is really a unique trial that will maybe really change it. It's enrolled well around the world, and I, I think I'm really uh, looking forward to those results. So it's an excellent list, and I'm also very impressed at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just want to know what type of iced tea it was, whether it's the New York variant or whether it's the... Yeah. Great. Thank you All very right, much. Thanks. Go ahead, Tim. So as a uh, general non-invasive cardiologist, thanks for being invited to your party. Um, the other thing is that when I was explaining to my daughter, who was with me, um, that I didn't have my slides done last night, she was like, she, as a 10-year-old, she didn't quite understand. So I think one of the mornings is kind of the MO for a lot of us, but at any rate. Um, so first, uh, I want to talk about what my definition of innovation is. Uh, I, as a general non-invasive cardiologist, there are no angiograms in my talk. Um, I was advised by some of my friends last night that maybe I should do that to make sure everybody's engaged, but really, it's a, a different perspective on, on innovation and healthcare delivery. So innovation to me is the application of new ideas in order to generate value. And what do I mean by value? Improving the outcomes relative to the cost or improving our, rel our revenue while maintaining optimal outcomes. Innovation is not uh, invention, it's not necessarily the generation of absolutely new ideas, and it's not creativity or idea generation without application. We have to really I apply it in routine care to make it innovative in our care delivery. And oftentimes, I think it's changing the perspective and how we think about things. So looking at something that we do every, time, every day, but changing how we do it in a way that's impactful and helpful for our patients. So what are the needs? First, we have needs of our patients. We don't meet the needs of our patients. I uh, work at the Minneapolis Heart Institute, and we serve a large population across the five-state region, but to provide a lot of our care requires that for them to come to Minneapolis, which is a large uh, drive for them, or transportation issues. How do we provide follow-up with them in a way that's convenient to the patient? In addition, oftentimes, we don't think about what's important to the patient in terms of their outcomes, what's important to them for their quality of life and their health-related outcomes. So I'll talk about innovations that will help us there. Accountability it used to be that we were really responsible for what happened within the silos of the hospital wall. Increasingly, we're going to be responsible for the population as a whole. So beyond their hospital stay, what happens as they return to routine care, in our case, the state of Minnesota, and beyond. And then finally, gaps in variation. We know there's tremendous variation in terms of how we practice. There's also tremendous variation in gaps in achieving the optimal outcomes for our patients or providing the therapies that we know are best. So how do we address these needs with the innovative solutions? And I'm going to offer three. I could talk probably for two hours, but I'm going to offer three that I think that are on the cusp. So one is telehealth. So how do we use telehealth to improve outcomes for our patients, mobile technology, and then finally leveraging the data? So telehealth, first of all, what is it? Broadly, it's essentially the transfer of an exchange of information. When you've Skyped with somebody, that's telehealth, but not with a, a health-related component. So at the Minneapolis Heart Institute, we're using this type of technology to interface with the patient via a, a video conference. We have their medical information at the point of care so we can review their chart. We can have a conversation with the patient about what is the problem, what is the need. It meets the need of the patient. They're, they're getting the care that they need out in their community that may be three or four hours away from where we are. This is oftentimes being used in the VA as well, where you have a large rural population that you need to provide those services. Within the frame of interventional cardiology, you could think about, well, what are those needs that we're providing the patient that 
potentially we could do better through a telehealth uh, type of approach. I know within electrophysiology, they're using telehealth for wound checks. In the same way, we have patients that are returning to their primary care provider at five days for a check of their groin. Would it be better potentially to use a telehealth approach to have them see an NP within your practice to make sure that the groin is, is okay, that they're taking their medications, and they really get the follow-up that you need? So what are the impacts? Improved access and patient experience, it's real time, it's face to face, it's targeted testing and transfer so that the patients that you're also seeing potentially in consultation prior to them coming to your center, that you know that you can help. As opposed to them coming to your center, you have a conversation, you say, well, actually, it's not appropriate for us to take you to the lab. It extends the uh, expertise and creates partnerships and there's also research opportunities looking at the benefits and limitations of this type of approach. And you can think about it in your own community, but you can think about the exp expansion beyond that. So certainly within the Minneapolis Heart Institute, we now have telehealth at Naples, Florida, given that we have a lot of snowbirds that go to the area, gives us the opportunity to maintain that connection with the patient. You can even think about international collaborations. Uh, last night I was thinking about this. I also thought you guys have real t uh, live cases that you share and demonstrate and, and learn techniques from. You could use this in, in routine care to help provide consultative services to someone who might be doing a new approach or a new technique. So mobile technology, um, certainly we've started to leverage mobile technology first to help providers. So what's the problem? We had providers out in our referring system that had outdated protocols in terms of the management of care. So for a STEMI, they didn't know what they were supposed to do in terms of were they supposed to give lytics? We have a half dose lytic system as well. Are they supposed to get dual antiplatelet therapy? So they had old information, outdated care that we had trouble maintaining. The info was not accessible, so they might have a poster somewhere in the emergency department, but it wasn't at the point of care. They didn't know where their protocols were. And it's challenging to update. So if we have some, some 50, 60, 70 odd referring centers, how do we update that information to make sure our referring centers are up to date to what they need to do? So the, the cardiovascular resources app was one approach that we've used to improve the, the delivery of care. It's essentially PDFs in an application form so that on their phone they can pull up and see what are the protocols I'm supposed to be following in care. And it also provides real uh, point of care touch contact so that they can call us and, and discuss the patient and make sure that they're uh, approaching these things correctly. So fingertip access to current cardiovascular protocols, single click access to consultative impulse, uh, input. We get more than 4,000 calls annually on this approach. And it's very simple in its functionality. So, We've intentionally kept it simple so that providers find it useful. If we over, made it overly complicated, I don't think that they'd use it as much. But then the question becomes, how do we extend this to the care of our patients? So more than 70% of Americans have smartphones, and that was updated a couple of years ago. It's probably upwards of 85% now. A lot of these are integrated with devices. I have a watch that's integrated with my phone that tracks a lot of data, but we don't use that data to support healthcare. And if you've t spoken to any um, healthcare delivery innovation companies recently, you know that there are a ton of companies that are focusing on how do we leverage all this data to improve care. So we've got this mass and mass of data, and, and there are companies that are developing patches that can capture 20 biometric data points and, and put that on your phone. And, and the thought is that that will lead us to the future in the immediate short term. I think that's not likely going to happen. I think there are going to be specific use cases, but I don't think you need to worry about the data from somebody's watch being part of what you're going to be asked to do in routine care. I think we are going to find specific use cases where mobile technology and data is going to help us. The first, home-based cardiac rehab. We know that there are data and there are studies that have demonstrated a mobile-based cardiac rehab program is as effective as brick and mortar. So if you live in a community that doesn't have cardiac rehab, we can provide you a mobile app that will ask you, have you done your exercise today? Have you taken your medications? And provide you the educational content that's part of cardiac rehab that improves patient outcomes. So it allows us to reach beyond brick and mortar to provide the benefit for cardiac rehab, improves patient outcomes, reduces readmissions, and now there's a reimbursement model for this as well. So CMS has changed reimbursement to allow you to, uh, to bill for this type of services through a mobile uh, device and creates an incentive to do this type of work. The other part, I spoke briefly about the importance of capturing the outcomes that are important to patient. Increasingly, we're going to be asked, did you improve the outcomes of this patient? Not in terms of did they live or die, but are they feeling better? Are they back to work? Is there are their symptoms reduced? How's their quality of life? And we need interfaces that allow us to capture that data, and a mobile platform does just that. It can uh, interface with the patient and ask, how are you feeling today? What is your symptom burden? And help us understand if we achieve the outcomes that are important to the patient will be increasingly important for quality and reimbursement measures, and proactively, we can identify opportunities to improve patient care. So if you have a patient that goes back 
to the, to the boonies and they have recurrence of angina symptoms, you won't know that until they return to their primary care doctor who may or may not identify it and then refer them back to you to, to improve their care. If you're surveying that patient about their return of symptoms, you can identify that and intervene more quickly. Finally, how do we leverage our data to improve our outcomes? So I'm a runner and a marathon runner. This is Elliot Kipchoge, who is trying to break the two-hour barrier. And he worked with Nike to capture as much data about his training program, his shoes, his recovery as possible to understand how they could kind of bend the curve in terms of breaking that two-hour barrier, this mythical two-hour barrier for the marathon. And by capturing all this data, looking at their training, opportunities to improve and be more efficient in the way that they ran, they did jump that curve. They made a dramatic improvement in his time, almost breaking that two-hour barrier. They did some things that actually wouldn't qualify because he was drafting, but at any rate, had an, a significant impact in understanding how they could do better. In the same way, in, in the cath lab and in our cardiovascular care, we can't improve what we don't measure. And so we need good data to see the gaps and identify the variation. Within our own healthcare system, we capture data from somewhere in the order of 80 different streams of data. We collaborate that, uh, collate that data in a way that allows us to identify gaps in variation in care and improve both the outcomes and the efficiency of our care um, for that high value care that we're seeking. But measurement alone is not the answer, so the keys to success are stakeholder input. As a general non-invasive cardiologist, I can see the data and identify potential opportunities, but I have to collaborate with my interventional cardiologist to truly understand where the opportunities are, and that has to be in partnership with our operational partners, so we invest the resources necessary to get to where we're going to achieve benefits. So that's where that success is achieved, is the overlap between the data analytics, the clinical insight, and the operational insight. And you also have to have transparency and what the motivation is. Value is different depending on the eye of the beholder. So if you don't have transparency in why you're trying to improve this outcome, you'll get pushback and people will dig in their heels and say, I don't see how that's beneficial either to our practice, to our patients. So there needs to be a conversation and understanding about why there, what is the motivation uh, to make that change. What's possible? So as a result of using and leveraging our data in the past three years, there's, these are some examples of improvements that we've uh, had. So, 1,000 ICU admissions avoided, a reduction in lab testing, a reduction in heart failure readmissions. So significant impacts, and in, in the impact of the healthcare system is on the multiple millions of dollars. So this provides us the incentive to keep doing this work. So with that, I'll close by saying again, a state of mind, it's not necessarily about generating a completely new idea, but thinking differently about the ideas that we have and the technology that we have available to us already. Thank you very much. Steven, that's really nice, uh, really forward thinking, but also kind of bringing it home to what we have uh, available to us right now. I think one of the things that always strikes me is the misalignment between motivations amongst the groups that you mentioned. Uh, obviously, we want to connect with our patients. That's what we want, and we want to provide them good care, but sometimes the uh, payer models are barriers. One way to interpret, for example, uh, 1,100 admissions avoided to ICUs is $220,000 of billing avoided, uh, you know, to physicians. Uh, and how, you know, the innovations that you're talking about, whether it be a, an alert that a patient wants their medication renewed in Epic, uh, you know, how come the, the technology and the payers are not kept up with our ideas about how we really want to take care of our patients yeah, I think, efficiently? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so this, this relates to the tension of how do you truly achieve value for care delivery when incentives aren't necessarily aligned. So I think that we've really tried to focus on those areas where there is alignment. And so there may be opportunities um, to both improve the outcomes while maintaining or actually optimizing our revenue. So if we're improving our outcomes for our patients, then at least we, we feel aligned within our health system. Certainly that's our payers that's challenging because then we need to talk to them about where are the opportunities where maybe we do less, so we admit less often to do less procedures, but how are you going to reimburse us in a way that that helps us continue? Certainly we can't um, do something that's gonna cut our, left, our, our leg off Otherwise, we can't stand financially. So a lot of the work that we do provides the financial umbrella so that we can do other aspects of work that potentially don't have that same financial compensation or motivation. Mm -hmm. And I think one so, important thing is to not abrogate our roles as leaders and instead become the person who has to obtain the preauthorization for the test or the renewal of the prescription and all these sorts of things where it's like this is efficient, but it's efficient by not having as many people employed. And I think we have to understand that uh, it's not beneath me to renew a prescription. I don't care, I can do it on my phone.
but maybe that's not the optimal use of, right. uh, of my time. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I love that, Steve. It's an outstanding talk. And I think, you know, yesterday there was a, a headline about the number of you know, 100,000 new startups and the um, dramatic amount of money that have been put into this, but almost all, like more than 95% are losing money. And I, th I think it's because it's misplaced. And the point is when you start with the patient, um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make care better and understanding where those gaps are. I think personally, uh, for all of us in the room, it's our responsibility to be part of providing good care and value-based care. And so I think it's really a great talk, and it's, it's applying what we know, which is the most important. Steve, do you think this will give us an opportunity to have uh, heart teams with heart conferences, at, even at sites where there isn't surgical backup for PCIs, and really help to make better decisions for patients? And yeah, I think you, you're talking about leveraging essentially that the mobile technology component or telehealth to essentially create a virtual heart team, and I think that that's an outstanding idea. Certainly, some centers aren't going to be large enough to have their own freestanding heart team within their center, and so I think that that would be a leverage, leveraging that technology in an innovative way to provide that collaborative care that would achieve the best outcomes for the patient. Any questions from the audience? Great, all right, well, let's move on. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Next, I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Michael Jessen, who's the uh, well. chairman of uh, cardiothoracic surgery at UT Southwestern. He'll be interloping here amongst us uh, interventionalists. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm very inter interested to hear about uh, your uh, discussion of the innovations in cardiac surgery. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a great uh, privilege to be here. I want to cover a lot of things in just a very short period of time, so this will just be a, a little spice of each. First thing I want to talk about is the radial artery. It's not just for catheterization anymore. In May of, late May of this year, the, uh, all five, or all six actually, of the biggest radial artery versus saphenous vein trials were MERS. This isn't a meta-analysis. It's actually a, a combination of, a, a data combination uh, uh, event. If you look at the slides on the right, they, they find that uh, the overall rate of death by carotid revascularization was better when radial arteries were used at, for one of the bypasses compared to a saphenous vein, typically into the left system. All these patients got mammary arteries to the LAD still. Graft failure was significantly lower, and this was measured by um, arteriography at, uh, in 75%, and a little more than 75% of both groups. And so patency rates are better in that, in that as well. So as compared with the use of saphenous vein grafts, the use of radial artery grafts for cabbage resulted in a lower race of, rate of adverse cardiac events and a higher rate of patency at five years of follow-up. So I think you will start to see surgeons uh, using this conduit more frequently. I think you should see bilateral mammary arteries used more commonly as a, aside from this. But I think uh, as cardiologists, you should actually be demanding some of this as well. Um, mechanical valves without Coumadin was a hope that we had. Um, in the past, the Realign trial, which looked at dabigatran versus Coumadin, was very unsuccessful. But a part of, about a, a PROACT trial, which involved 41 centers in the United States and, uh, and Canada and Europe, was uh, finished several years ago, and the long-term results of this are now available. There were two basic parts to this trial. The first type was what's called the high-risk group. And this, this, in this group, patients with aortic stenosis that got an onyx aortic valve, mechanical valve, were randomized either to uh, an INR goal of 2 to 3 or an INR goal of 1.5 to 2. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see that the bleeding rates were lower in the lower INR rates, but that did not, but there was no effect on uh, thromb thromboembolic events. And so that device now has, uh, that particular valve has an FDA label for running lower anticoagulation levels after three months in the 1.5 to 2 range. There was another part of this trial that we were part of as well, and that was a trial with very low risk patients. Uh, normal sinus rhythm, decent ventricular function, only aortic stenosis, only aortic valve replacement, few other criteria, and those patients were ran, and they were all tested for sensitivity for, to both aspirin and plavix. And those patients, 200 of those patients, were randomized one to one to either a dual antiplatelet alarm or uh, ion, or a cubitin with an INR of two to three. Results of that were not as, uh, as, a, as a effective, and the FDA data safety monitoring uh, group actually stopped this trial. The, ble the bleeding rates uh, shown on the left were not significantly different between the two groups. 
However, the thrombotic ra rates were much were significantly higher, and continued the, gr the the curves continued to separate out to six or seven or even eight years. And that trial has been stopped. Uh, inter two interesting points on this: 24% of the patients in the dual antiplatelet therapy were retested and found no longer to be to reactive to, uh, to 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 Plavix, which may have played some role in this, even though they were re responsive at the beginning of the trial. The other interesting fact is that 44% of the patients in the dual group were, were recommended to go back to, uh, dual, to, to Coumadin and actually declined. So dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with higher rates of thromboembolism and valve thrombosis compared with the control of the low-risk arm. Hybrid revascularization is becoming an interesting uh, interest in a number of, of uh, areas. The five-year results of a prospective randomized trial of 200 patients uh, from Europe has now been uh, published. That, that came out uh, earlier this year in uh, in Jack. The uh, interesting results of uh, the interesting of this interesting results of this were that the freedom from all-cause mortality and of most major adverse cardiac events were similar between the two groups. So there has been a lot of uh, resistance to some, uh, to some uh, groups to taking a hybrid approach where the mammary artery or the anterior surface is, is revascularized with the LAD to get that benefit. And then rather than typically saphenous veins, uh, the, they use an um, uh, approach with uh, drug eluting stents. That appears to be a safe result. The results are early, and it's uh, very selected patients. But this may, be a, this may be an encouraging thing, so that the hybrid coronary vascularization appears to have a similar five-year all-cause mortality when compared with conventional coronary bypass grafting. One of the interesting things of this trial was that the incidence of revascularization at five years was 37% in the hybrid group, but 45% in the coronary bypass surgery group, much higher than other trials. That, that particular finding is not, uh, is not explained and will need further work. Currently, less than half percent of uh, bypass surgery in the United States is done as a hybrid revascularization. Um, some of the new technologies in uh, cardiovascular surgery are quite interesting. One of those is machine perfusion for heart transplantation. There are devices now that rather than uh, taking a heart out at a donor hospital, pl placing it in, in a cardioplegia solution in an ice storage, uh, there's, there's interest in perfusing those hearts with blood-based solutions or other solutions as well. The PROCEED trial, which uses a, a device from uh, Transmedics called the Organ Care System, perfuses hearts and, as you can see in here, keeps the heart actually beating during that time. Uh, st this, the initial trial of this was, uh, was, was published in 2015 in The Lancet and showed that the, the device was able to maintain pretty normal coronary flows and pretty, enable, uh, pretty, uh, pretty normal aortic parameters. Also, they measured lactate concentrations, and they, were, they did not change over the time of that thing, or over the time of the study. Uh, uh, some preservations up to nine hours were done in, the, uh, in this control, uh, in, in the uh, machine perfusion arm of that. Um, but there has not, the, uh, the FDA did not grant approval for that device, and that device is actually does not have an FDA label yet. There has been interest, however, in expanding the clinical use of this device in what's called donation after circulatory death donors. These are donors who are not brain dead, but have irreversible causes. They're taken to an operating room, typically, where ventilatory support is stopped, and then they die within 20 to 30 minutes, and when, uh, when cardiac asystole is obtained, uh, two to five minutes later, the heart is, or is, uh, is uh, harvested. This leads to a greater ischemic burden on these uh, hearts. It's been used in other organs, but there has been now um, expanded use of this in heart transplantation as well. And this is a report of, uh, that came out in 2017 of 45 total patients of DCD uh, heart transplants. Those are the higher risk ones. The one-year survival rate on those using this OCS device, organ care system device was 91%, which is very comparable. So I think that in the future we may start to see more interest in using these perfusion devices to try to get some of the higher risk donors used to increase the donor pool to enable us to treat some of the sickest patients that, uh, that we're faced with. Um, in, in, the, in the realm of pediatric cardiac surgery, we've moved even beyond neonatal cardiac surgery now into the fetal cardiac surgery realm. You can argue if this is surgery or if this is intervention, and I think it's really a combination of, of teams of uh, dedicated people from both, from all multiple different disciplines that really make this uh, happen now. But we're seeing now more and more uh, patients that are diagnosed, all, virtually all patients with the, uh, uh, the vast majority of patients with complex congenital heart disease can be diagnosed uh, prenatally. 
and many of the things, for example, for treatment of severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction that could progress to very to uh, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome and to systems situations where the patient ends up with a single ventricle repair can now be probably avoided. Um, in this uh, in this dem demonstration here, and don't try this at home, please. The needle is going through the the abdominal wall of the woman, then through the womb. And then later, as it, it, the needle enters into the apex of the left ventricle of the developing fetus, a guide wire is then passed through that, through the ventricle, and out through the left ventricular outflow tract. And then a balloon is inflated in the outflow tract here to open up the annulus and increase the size of that. This is usually done at mid-gestation. And, this, and then uh, the, the hope is that the, the child then develops this chamber size and aortic size better so that a two-chamber repair can be, uh, can be done later on. So this is a, there's been a few hundred of these cases done worldwide now. I think this is going to be the next sort of frontier in, in uh, pediatric cardiac surgery. And lastly, I want to mention a little bit about uh, endovascular aortic repair. It's now pretty much the standard in abdominal aortic aneurysm and in descending and, and thoracoabdominal work as well. But now we're moving into zone zero and zone one in the ascending aorta and the transverse arch. This is really believed by most to be the final frontier. Several devices have been uh, looked at. The overall stroke rate in the early results, and most of this is very early, is around 10%, with maybe 7% major strokes and 3.5% 3 minor strokes in this trial. That is what we are guiding patients in our uh, investigational uh, uh, device and device trials. This is one that, that we have used. This is a Cook A branch stent graft. Uh, the, the images are sent to Cook and uh, a specialized uh, graft is produced, it takes a period of several weeks, so there's no urgent cases that can be done with this, which has openings that line up with the arch vessels. Um, a tapered uh, mid-segment uh, mid is developed in this stand with a proximal and distal seal components designed specifically to the patient's anatomy from the, uh, uh, from the three DCDs that are sent in for the uh, development of these. This is an example. This is a case that uh, we did. This is actually the uh, second patient in the United States to get this device. And it shows in here a, a, a saccular type uh, aneurysm in the transverse arch. You can see a previous mitral uh, rep ring, a repair ring in there. Patients had previous heart surgery. But this device was designed for this patient, positioned in there, and uh, lined up. This has got the Phillips mask where you can, uh, you can merge the, the data from the CT and your uh, imaging at the same time. The device is deployed, and then uh, the device, you can see a, another component then being placed in the anomalous artery here, and ultimately you can see devices that are present, presented, uh, deployed in both the anomalous artery, the left carotid, and the left subclavian, giving a complete arch reconstruction percutaneously and uh, covering all of the uh, stent there. And the, final res the final result looks like that with uh, complete uh, uh, coverage of the uh, aneurysm in the transverse arch. So these are some of the things that are coming up. Uh, I think that this is a very exciting field in cardiovascular medicine overall, and it's a great privilege to be a part of that, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. That was incredible. I mean, to see uh, the gambit of interventions from a fetal heart to this, you know, gen ginormous uh, aneurysm taken care of uh, percutaneously is amazing. I'm, I'm really glad too that uh, you know I got to see this because um, sadly I, I don't keep up as well in the on the uh, cardiac surgery literature. So uh, to know that you guys are are doing things like this is really impressive. So my uh, that, that was fascinating, and I I think for for me the one that's been impressive for me is the aortic work, and it's really a personalized medicine approach, right? Where it, right. really everybody gets there. It's almost a personalized stint graft. Um, but I want to ask you about what's not on your list. Um, you know, really for the last five to 10 years, we've been, we have this huge number of patients with class three and class four heart failure. And this anticipated um, better total artificial hearts and total uh, pumps. So what's not on your list is advances in um, our uh, ability to have pumps to obviate the need for transplant. Yeah, I think that it's been a little bit slow development, I would say, in the last years. The only uh, artificial heart is the um, uh, Syncardia device right now. It is used very infrequently, a handful of cases in the United States. It's also going into the pediatric world as well. 
The one thing that is happening in the left ventricular assist devices is that there is more interest in certainly smaller devices and in devices uh, that, that do not have the um, same thrombotic problems as the initial pusher plate devices, so the, the continuous flow devices. And those trials are continuing, but the incremental change in those, I would agree, has been slower in the last few years. There's, but the one thing is there is certainly a huge number of patients that would benefit from those, and that's where I think a lot of work has to be done. Michael, can I put you on the spot and have your prediction for after low-risk TAVR trials come out, what the role of the cardiac surgeon will be in TAVR? Well, I, you know, we have a great program where we actually work very strongly with our team, and I hope most places do too. We cross the valves, we deploy them. So we, we, we want to see TAVR move forward, and we, we want to see that. The, the biggest thing for me in the low-risk trials is, um, the, is the young patient. And a 50-year-old 50, a 50 person who gets a TAVR will do well. His, if, it's, if it's just a one- or a two-year outcome, they will do at least as well as surgery, I believe. But what we don't know is the long-term um, uh, structural valve degeneration and how we will manage that in patients, whether we can go device in device or we can do that once, but then if, if the device lasts eight years and then the next device lasts eight years, then I've got a 66-year-old man with two devices and a, and a bigger problem. So the long-term data is going to be very, very important for that, but we're excited about it. I really think this is going to help a lot of people. You know, a, a kind of, and he's a contentious guy, Paul Tierstein, uh, made the suggestion that after the low-risk trial comes out that it should be mandatory to get an interventional consult uh, for anybody with aortic valve disease rather than what we do uh, now, yeah. right? Uh, well, I think that, you know, we see a lot of people who actually ask for that in our uh, advanced valve clinic. But a young person, I often give them the guidance that, well, you're, you're likely, even today, you're likely to have a higher risk of paravalvar leak, you're likely to have a higher risk of a pacemaker, and you're likely to have, a, you're going to get a, a biologic valve that will require something else down the thing. And those are the big unknowns. Uh, compared to doing what we do now is the minimally invasive uh, operations where people in, are in hospital three or four days, get a standard valve and, and can do very well where we have 20, 20 or 25 year data on. So I think when the data comes out, it'll be easier to know. But I'm not ready to, uh, to advise the young people to, uh, to move into uh, TAVR as the first. And, and that may be the right way to go, to buy us enough time to get to a point where the 50, 60 year old person is now what we actually know about. Yeah, for Taver. Yeah, you know, a 50-year-old person, his next best 15 years are going to be the ones you, that he has right now. It's not going to be when he's 65. But so a lot of people want to have something minimally invasive, avoid anticoagulation and the problems with that. And I, and I get that. Um, but I just think we want to have something that, as people are living older, that is quite durable too, or that at least we can manage any changes that occur downstream. Yeah. Hey, this is great. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend uh, Tim Henry, who's going to be talking with us. Sorry, sorry. Manos, yeah. Quick question. Like, you know, there was a presentation just for the people because the radial is a big point that people will do the arterial revascularization. And I noticed your slide on the New England paper that looks fascinating. But we've had challenges convincing at least some of the surgeons to do arterial revascularization either with IMA or radials. Any thoughts on how this can change on the long term and the surgical? Well, I think it's going to get into the guidelines. The last 2011 guidelines, I, I was part of that committee that wrote that, and it, I don't think it was strong enough then. But I think that clearly now, any, any person that is a reasonable risk should be getting at least two arterial conduits into the left side. I'm hoping that will evolve through the guidelines, and it may be even through SDS quality metrics. But um, you know, I think that it is becoming pretty clear now that, the, the, that we can do better than the vein graphs that we are right now. Thanks, Manos. Uh, Tim, uh, welcome from Cedar sinai uh, Help t uh, tell us about the innovations in STEMI care. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, it, I think, first of all, congratulations, Manos and Paul, et cetera. This has been, uh, it's a very innovative meeting. And I like the new uh, approaches to how we do this. So if you'll notice my talk, it, innovation in STEMI management, there's a question mark at the end. So uh, we'll start with that and see where to do. So, I don't have any specific disclosures. I think this is a really challenging talk to cover in 10 minutes. But I, I'm going to hopefully to make some take home points of where we are. So really, this is the problem, plaque rupture. The solution is really one hour artery cleaners. And we have made remarkable, I've been working in STEMI for more than 30 years. And really, I'd start off by saying it's 
remarkable the progress we've made. And I would tell you that's one of the challenges as we're going to come back to. What, so what's standard of practice now? PCI centers should do PCI in a timely manner, less than 90 minutes. Short distance transfers should have PCI in a timely manner, less than 120 minutes. And it's still a little controversial for long distance transfers or those with an expected delay. We're not really going to cover it now, but this is still a big issue all around the world. So my one most important point I'll start off with innovations with STEMI is that all of you out there, you should be doing outstanding STEMI. And in your own institution, if you're not, the first innovation is make sure your institution is doing what you should do and what's capable and, and what's possible in 2018. So that's number one. You have to do that yourself. I would start off by also telling you that this is personal for me. You know, on the left side is my grandfather who died when I was a sophomore in high school from acute myocardial infarction. And if it was today, there's no way he would die. And on the right side is where I think we need to go is my father who just died two years ago of out of hospital cardiac arrest and didn't need to if we actually are doing the things that we want to do. The second thing I'll do is a patient of mine that I took care of for a long time. And at his funeral, they said, it came and they said, you know, Pastor was always wonderful. We told him, I love the way you look outside the box. And he said, I didn't even know there was a box. And I think that's the way we need to approach our care when we do this. So when you look at STEMI research and you look at translation research, reperfusion injury trials, hypothermia trials, post-conditioning, hyperoxemic oxygen, stem cell therapy, et cetera, there's a million of them. There's always strong preclinical data and there's always good open label phase one trials. But then what happens? Here comes circumstances beyond our control and I'm gonna show you a couple of them, right? The, the field is littered with unsuccessful phase two and three trials. And here's it, cool AMI, acute MI, less than six hours, randomized primary PCI with primary PCI plus cooling, looking at infarct size, no differences in infarct size. Infarct size is about 14%, we'll come back to that. But when you looked inside the numbers, maybe the patients that got cooled faster in anterior infarcts, maybe you saw a difference. That was true both in cool MI and ICE-2. Post-conditioning, great preclinical data, great small little trials, but when you actually did a randomized trial, this was done in, in Minneapolis with Jay Travers, uh, 100 patients randomized, only occluded arteries, randomized to uh, post-conditioning or not, Important when you looked at the data, no mortality, basically. One MACE, and it was related to stroke, one acute stent thrombosis, one TVR, no recurrent MIs. These 100 patients had no events, all right? No difference in, in infarct size and no difference in myocardial salvage. So post-conditioning, and it didn't reduce the incidence of microvascular obstruction. But look at microvascular obstruction was in about 60% of the patients, and there was zero events at one year effectively. So conclusions, post-conditioning did not re decrease infarct size, very low event rates, and we are going to look at the one-year data that will be coming up later this year. So what about cell therapy? So this is in 2006, this is a repair MI trial. This is really one of the highlight trials of the year was a repair MI. And they showed that there was a difference. If your EF was less than uh, 49%, you had a significant improvement in uh, LVF by LV gram with bone marrow mononuclear cells. And in particular, if you were treated late. More importantly, I think that repair MI data at five years show the decrease in event rates with the cell-treated patients. So this generated a lot of enthusiasm. Going forward, we know that bone marrow, as we get older, the number of our stem cells and the potency of the stem cells decline. So instead, it would be nice to give an, a, uh, uh, an allogeneic cell, so an off-the-shelf cell to patients with cell therapy. We did that, actually showed you might be able to improve uh, ejection fraction uh, in, in anterior infarcts. And you had the Caduceus trial, which really showed a one-month post-MI, Patients randomized to autologous cardiac-derived stem cells had a reduction in scar mass and an improvement in viable mass. So this laid the groundwork for the All-Star trial. 
And I think the Ulster trial is really illustrative of this problem with innovation in STEMI. So their first one, there was a phase one open label trial, and then there was a phase two trial that was supposed to recruit 300 patients with large infarcts. So with 30 centers over four years, the actual recruitment was about 0.1 patient per month per site. Do these patients even exist anymore? Question number one. So actually, when you looked at it, we actually uh, ended up with about 140 patients in the trial. EFs were about 39%. SCAR sizes were about 24%. So actually larger than the, hype, than the Coolit trials. And, and there's another trial in Europe that was just done that had SCAR sizes of 35%. Whether it's really scar size or not is a separate issue, but large infarcts, large scar size. Well, no differences in scar size when we randomized the trial, but it was woefully underpowered because it was half as big as it should be. And more importantly, no events. So these are the largest infarcts. Large anterior infarcts, scar size is over 20%, and zero deaths at one year. All right, and very low other events. So conclusions, no difference in scar size. Uh, there was improvement in volumes in BMP, very low clinical events, favored sort of the treatment group. But there was challenges in recruitment and then there's challenges in measurement. So we use MRI as sort of the gold standard, but I'm gonna show you a slide that says, is, is, gold, is MRI really a gold standard? Because you have both dropout and there's significant variability in MRI as an endpoint. So um, when you look at it, I would say starting off with STEMI, these are the challenges. We've done so well that we have a changing natural history. I have an editorial in Circ Research coming out now that says, have we reached futility in STEMI trials. Because we looked at 1,500 patients enrolled in trials with large infarcts, and the mortality at one year is 1%. And it's because we've done so well. Second of all, it's a dynamic process. So what happens on day one versus day three versus day seven versus day 30 is very different. And then second of all, it's really hard to enroll high-risk trials, and personally, I think if we're gonna go forward, the two groups to work on is those patients with an abnormal IMR, and we do that at the time of the STEMI. I think it's critically important. We should do it almost routinely. And then second is cardiogenic shock and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and I'll end with that in a few minutes. But another really big problem in this is we have suboptimal endpoints. There's no Gord standard, and MRI is not. This is actually data from the time trial that we just published in Circ Research. So first of all, there was about a 25% dropout. And you look at the pair data on the left, you saw no differences in di injection fraction. Everybody was 50%, everyone got better. But who dropped out? The patients who dropped out were on the right side, and those are patients who had the EFs of 35%. So all these trials that look at serial MRIs lose about 25% of the patients in the trial, and they lose all the sick people. So that's why you don't see any differences in the trials. So now I'm saying, there's a lot of STEMI work going on. These, I'm gonna say, these are research refinements and are not gonna make very much difference in our care. Optimal antiplatelet antithrombin, stint choice and design, radiofemoral, thrombectomy, post conditioning, et cetera. Those are minor. Where can we make a difference in STEMI? And this is a list where we can make a difference. And this is, I love this quote by Bill Gates, and it's really perfect for um, uh, Steve's uh, uh, talk. Humanity's greatest advances are not in the discoveries, but how those discoveries are applied. So I'll go back to the first point in innovation. Every person out here should make sure you are doing great STEMI care and that your outcomes are 1% mortality at one year. So number one, that's where you should be. That's the standard of care now. But these are the challenges. We have a lot of work to do with multi-vessel PCI. And I think the complete trial is gonna be a really important trial pushing us forward. And likewise, in the culprit shock trial was the start of, of multi-vessel disease with cardiogenic shock. Number two, in-hospital STEMI. Almost nobody has protocols to take care of in-hospital STEMI. And the most uh, dangerous place to have an MI right now is in the hospital. 
So this needs a lot of work for sure. Patients with expected delay, and I really think we've got come to a pharmacoinvasive approach. I'm not going to cover it today, but it does is worthy of research, but really mostly all around the world and not as much in the United States. So the two big ones are out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, both prevention, identification, and treatment, a huge area of research. Advanced cardiogenic shock, I think, is really important and a place where we can make a difference in the next five years in particular. And culprit shock was a, it, uh, at least the first step because it was an excellent design. I think cell therapy has a role, but uh, it'll be specific, really, uh, a specific group of people. And then finally, I'll end with quality and reporting. And I think this is really an opportunity for innovation. And a paper that actually we just published with Steve uh, was value-based care. So what we did is we looked at our uh, retrospective STEMIs and we applied the Zwolle risk score. It turns out half of your STEMIs are low risk. And if you look at those low risk, those patients don't need to go to the CCU and they can go home in less than 48 hours. And so then we implemented that using electronic medical record and we looked at it prospectively. And if you can see, the patients who followed the protocol in blue that were low risk and went home had very low event rates, basically no mortality in hospital and almost no mortality at one year. If you were low risk but for some reason we thought you needed to go to the CCU or your intermittent, and then the high risk patients were where the events were. And when we looked at it, you could see more than half the patients went home in less than 48 hours as planned, and it saved the hospital system nearly a million dollars a year. So I would call that a very important innovation in STEMI care that all of us can do in terms of doing value-based care. So with that, you have to be very careful uh, if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. There still are opportunities for innovation in STEMI care, but we have to be thoughtful about where those are. Thank you. Great, Tim. Uh, I think, um, you know, you, you touched on a number of things in STEMI care. Uh, I'm really glad it, it wasn't about rescuing side branches and things like that. <laughs> it, it really is about what we can make a difference in. One of the vexing problems for me as an interventionalist in a public reporting state are yeah. these cardiac arrest patients. What do you think about that? Yeah, critically important. You saw it was on my list on the bottom with quality and, and public mm -hmm. reporting. And, I, and there's some good data in it, but we need to look at it more carefully. But I think public reporting in the states that do it routinely has pushed STEMI care backwards. It's less likely to take care of high-risk patients, and the high-risk patients are really out of hospital cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock. If you looked at the, you know, we have a, a paper that we're looking at right now. Why do STEMI patients die? Do you know why? In 2018, the number one cause of death is brain death. Number one is brain death. Number two is cardiogenic, is cardiogenic shock. But if you look at the patients that die of cardiogenic shock, those are people who died before they got to the cath lab. So really, once you get to the cath lab, the number of people that die is very small. And so this, those are the people that are the problem with public reporting. So we want to work on the people that are dying uh, the most. And we have to solve the problem for sure, Dwayne. It's not simple. Tim, with a 1% mortality rate at one year, um, what, what is the right outcome? Because clearly mortality no longer is. Yeah. So that's why I think, you know, for me, really. And now, would it make a difference at 20 years? The answer is some of those patients with large infarcts will have a difference potentially in heart failure at 10 years or 20 years, but it's too expensive to follow that. So I would say in, tri in terms of trial design, if we can actually fi find a way to inexpensively follow people for longer periods of time, that would be a great innov innovation. But you're not going to make a difference in mortality. You're just not. And that was my problem when you're talking about the door-to-unloading on door -to trial, is if you just take unselected STEMI patients, they all do fine. So that's my problem, because it might be a good thing to do, but you're testing it in the wrong patient population. So, um, and so I think, Steve, the quality things, like I think that, that the, if every place in the United States did the, the low risk, you know, the value-based uh, approach to care, look how much money we would save and how much care would be better. So those, I think, are opportunities for innovation.
think the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the other aspect of what's important to a patient. Um, what's their symptom burden? What's their functional status? Have they returned to work? Yeah. And so if you have a, uh, an innovation or opportunity where you reduce infarct size and so the, the proposition is that they're going to have less heart failure, you're not going to necessarily see that mortality. You've demonstrated that. But you might see that they are able to continue to mow the lawn and go golfing, whereas they weren't if they didn't have that intervention. So it's the capture of the, the patient-reported health outcomes that matter to the patient. You know, another opportunity is actually adherence. If you look at the people that, like, the patients who take their dual lining platelet and their statin, they have almost no events. The events are all in the patients that don't. So another area of innovation, I think, is finding a way to work on that patient population that for some reason is not compliant. And, and just to be clear, that's not necessarily just because they aren't taking their medications. It's everything that goes along with being yes, adherent. Yes, so it is. It's, it's not just the effect size of the adherence. It's the, the healthy behavior effect that goes along with that. Yes, completely agree. Tim, you made some uh, comments on you know, how can we improve? So we have to be better as interventionists. And, and you, I think you indicated a little bit of, of access, too. So when we do structural cases, we know more and more that we actually miss a lot of patients. We just don't see them. They're not referred. They're not treated adequately. They never see us, right? But in, in, um, in coronary disease or STEMIs, how, do you know from any kind of data how many patients, because of you know, lack of access, lack, lack of education, are we missing? Is this, is this an opportunity? Because we are so ineffective in the United States. So, right? yeah. No, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I'll tell you, because this is one that's really annoyed me for a long time, is uh, or, or, there's a paper by uh, Dr. Kokanen that shows, you know, around 2001 to 2006, this is where this was kind of recognized that there was a, a lack of access to STEMI care, uh, primary PCI specifically. And so there was a 44% increase in the number of cath labs over the ensuing five years. And uh, that led to a 0.9% increase in access from 80 to 80.9% uh, of patients. So what does that tell you? That tells us, tells you as physicians, we decided to just build cath labs to compete with one another rather than to build cath labs to uh, to bring it to where they were needed. And that's going to be the same thing for structural heart. I mean, there are like a billion structural heart programs in Boston, but they're not actually in Western Massachusetts where the people are. Now, mercifully, this is a semi-elective procedure. So, you know, maybe there's a little buffer there of transferring patients in and centers of excellence, and that's kind of going to be actively debated. But when it comes to STEMI, we actually failed at that so let me, let me say that, add two things for that, because it's a really important question. Um, first, in the United States, I think there's places where we have too much access. And I'll tell you an example now in Los Angeles, there's too many STEMI receiving centers. And in another talk I do, I actually show two patients, 50 years old, clear-cut ST elevation, went into labs, did not get their artery fixed for some reason or another and got transferred and died. Two 50-year-olds that died. But they're not even in any registry because they didn't get a PCI, okay? So that's one problem. I think too much access and what we need to do, and I started off by saying the best innovation is each one of you need to make sure you're doing it great at your site. Second thing I'll say is around the world, STEMI in the United States is one thing and that was my focus here. But STEMI in the world is increasing. So if you look in, in Malaysia and in India and in, in Russia and China, the number of STEMIs is increasing dramatically. And the age at STEMI onset in Malaysia and India is now around 40. So this is still a worldwide problem and access worldwide is a huge issue. Right, with that. All right, so I'm going to talk with you uh, about the innovations in antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy. I'll let Manos know that I uploaded these about 3:30 uh, in the morning, so I'm really interested to see what they say. Uh, all right, so first, first innovation is, that I'd like to talk about. Uh, so I'm actually going to touch on some of the themes that the other panelists. Uh, talked about that many 
of our future innovations in antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy are going to be little to do with new medications. Uh, as Tim said, it's going to be, or as I guess Bill Gates said, it's going to be the implementation of the medications that we already have. And, uh, and one example is the use of Cangrelor uh, amongst patients who haven't been pretreated before their uh, PCIs and trying to abrogate the risk of intraprocedural thrombotic complications. Uh, in this case, Cangrelor uh, 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 was associated with fewer in procedure. Uh, uh, complications, specifically stent thrombosis, and we looked at uh, how much do these actually these events uh, cost? Uh, because we're often in hospitals focused on the acquisition costs of drugs or stents or devices or procedures, and uh, in the cath lab it led to an increase of about three thousand bucks, six thousand bucks to the hospitalization, a per procedural MI around four thousand bucks, and if there was a stent thrombosis, you can see how exceptionally. Uh, expensive it is to deal with these types of procedures. For us, you know, we do a procedure, you know, we lose the side branch or the vessel shuts down, we deal with it, and we're usually giving high fives uh, to each other saying, you know, we got out of jail, but, you know, maybe there's a better method to avoid this in the first place. Uh, we now have the ability to uh, reverse uh, anticoagulation amongst patients receiving uh, DOAX. Uh, the Anexa 4 study led to the um, approval of a, a Dexanet. Uh, this is something I don't know. Uh, I, our hospital, we don't have it. Uh, does anybody have it available, Tim? You guys uh, have it? So not yet. There's, a, there's kind of a staged rollout, but what I will tell you is this going, is going to, I think, release the intellectual burden that we have against using some of these medications uh, that uh, may be associated with uh, risk of bleeding but our worry is that we wouldn't necessarily be able to reverse it. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, outcomes related to the utilization of this uh, medication stratified by uh, type of, of DOAC and a number of different factors. But in general, uh, these were, the use of this medication was associated with, uh, with the achievement of hemostasis. I showed this slide a couple of days ago. Uh, of my partner, uh, Mike Gibson, having run the Pioneer AF PCI study, looking at around the 20% of patients who have atrial fibrillation associated with their PCI and rivaroxaban-based therapies versus what we uh, consider the, uh, the gold standard, which is triple therapy, and just drawing your attention to the clinical outcome, which was a reduction in bleeding. This is where I want to draw more attention to today is the implementation of this strategy. And I think uh, our panelists and you will all will agree that we can do the best PCI in the lab and then when we transfer the patient either to the floor or home and we're not communicating effectively of what the uh, anticoagulant antiplatelet strategy can be, we end up with situations that may be dangerous for the patient. We looked in our own database and found that we have hundreds of patients that are discharged on dual antiplatelet therapy with full dose DOAC. And that's because I did some angioplasty, transferred them to the floor, and then someone had a few minutes of atrial fibrillation, and we had an, uh, such an exceptional push to get the people out of the hospital is someone starts them on full dose rivaroxaban. And I just point out to you here the reason why Mike chose five milligrams as the dose that goes along with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is the tenfold increased risk in fatal bleeding associated with just the 10 milligram dose, let alone the 20 milligram dose that some of these patients are going on. And remember, in this trial, the vast majority of patients had clopidogrel, but you can imagine the mix and matching that is occurring with full dose of this plus full dose of ticagrelor or prasacril, and I've had a TIA in the past and such. So I think this is a major threat to, in the implementation to our patients, and I think being able to deal with this in some of the ways that Stephen brought up uh, will be helpful. But also as we look at costs of implementation, these were the costs of uh, rehospitalizations uh, um, in this trial. And you see that though the medications cost a little bit more, uh, or depending on your perspective, a lot bit more. Overall, uh, the cost to the system was reduced because of uh, fewer rehospitalizations and cardiovascular event costs. So, uh, shifting gears, it has already been mentioned uh, that we're kind of ramping down on the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. 
um, and looking at it with uh, current uh, iterations of stents, uh, utilizing shorter duration of DAPT amongst patients who are uh, deemed to be at high bleeding risk. You know, I was talking with some electrophysiologists and they were uh, discussing, you know, really innovative strategy of putting left atrial appendage closure devices in patients who had just received stents to try to reduce the, the, time, the, the time that they're on triple therapy. And I looked with, you know, a uh, kind of puzzle at this and they were saying, well, you know, you guys got to have people on dual antiplatelet therapy for a year and, uh, and you know, with warfarin, uh, that's going to lead to a lot of bleeding. We should put appendage closures into these people. And, and I said that that's kind of state of the art five years ago. Uh, we're going to be having shorter and shorter duration of DAPT, and as I showed you in the slides before, we're not going to probably be using triple therapy in the first place. So I think having conversations with our colleagues, too, about what should be uh, the proper strategy. Other studies that are looking at shortening the duration of DAPT amongst high bleeding risk patients, uh, ongoing Science 90 study run by Roxana Maron, uh, also run by her is a, a one-month uh, uh, study and uh, ramping up right now uh, in site selection is a one-month study with the Onyx stent. This was shown earlier, uh, the Twilight study that Roxana is also running, uh, looking at uh, avoiding uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in the 12 months uh, after uh, this uh, three-month period of using dual antiplatelet therapy. And I think it makes sense to us that uh, the immediate threat to the patient who's just had a stent is stent thrombosis. But that risk decreases substantially over time, and shouldn't we tailor our therapy to that declining risk, whether that be reducing the aspirin or changing agents? I think these are gonna be coming uh, strategies. So, to summarize, new drugs and strategies will do things better, we're gonna do things safer, we're gonna do things more efficiently, we're gonna have to question long-held paradigms, and these, uh, uh, these things are going to benefit not only the patients, but overall the healthcare system. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Can I ask you, I think this uh, triple therapy is becoming, for everyone, a nightmare. I have asked questions, what should we do, what should we not? And since you're the innovation person, what should we do right now for in triple therapy? People going warfarin or NOAX and they have PCI, what should we be doing afterwards? So um, my, my practice right now is to utilize uh, clopidogrel and rivaroxaban or uh, clopidogrel and uh, dabigatran because those are the uh, regimens that I think are associated with the lowest risk of bleeding and have the most data behind them. That may be inconvenient. That may require checking with pharmacies and how much are the patients gonna have to pay uh, that may actually take a little bit of extra work uh, to deal with, but uh, if there's also these kind of unconventional reasons to, to be on triple therapy, like we're worried that they have akinetic apex or they're on it for uh, uh, pulmonary embolism prevention and such, then I may uh, change what I do, but uh, they have cancer, for example, and we want them on Lovenox and so, and so there's all these scenarios, but you know, I think trying to keep up with all of this and as well as involving uh, my colleagues, hematologists and other interventional cardiologists, trying to come up with standardized protocols too is important. We have some hard stops being developed in our, uh, our OMR so that we can't order some of these uh, regimens that we think are associated with worse outcomes. Should you give the 15 in Varoxaban or you give 20 in Varoxaban for the people? Since you know, 15 is not available, right? So how, how do you deal with give so, the 120 dose? Yeah, so we can get the 15, we can't get the five. Uh, so we can't do the DAPT with five milligrams of rivaroxaban yet. But I think uh, as was shown earlier between Compass, uh, Atlas and Pioneer, that uh, soon we should have uh, that five milligram dose uh, approved. So Dwayne, I would say, you know, this is an issue where we have great agents, it's how we apply them, right? And um, so two I'd like to talk about is, uh, y you know, if uh, Kinglor was free, we'd use it in every case, right? Because it's like immediate on great P2Y12 inhibition. So one of is how do you deal with the costs and how then do you apply it to the patient populations of who you need it? The second one I want to say is, you know, I'm a 
no one's a stronger believer in standardized protocols than me. But this issue about anticoagulation post PCI is, you know, the AFib patient and how long you do DAPT. If there's ever an example of where we need personalized approaches, it's that. So it, it's probably the hardest area to do standardized protocols. Yeah, I think, you know, there's the intersection of risk scores uh, and rules that really kind of hurt us. Like how, I call it the tyranny of the CHADS in the hospital is because we can calculate a CHADS uh, VAST score, everybody believes that that stroke risk is the most immediate threat to the patient who's just, you know, undergone a PCI. When in the short term, stroke is probably not their, their, their biggest, uh, stroke prevention is not their biggest problem. Uh, that's one thing, but you're right, setting up these protocols is difficult. Uh, trying to implement them is probably even more difficult, uh, trying to get everybody to buy into them. But uh, I do think that it is it, trying to avoid actually some of these red lights, like uh, regimens that are dangerous, I think is actually relatively easy. I think you had another question. Well, uh, the other one was how do we do, like for instance, Kangalore, right? Oh, yeah. It's it, uh, pharmacologically, it's perfect, right? But it's the cost, and it's then who do you apply it, and when is it worthwhile? Uh, because I don't think that we're that great at predicting. Stent thrombosis has gotten to be so low, we're not great at predicting who it is. Where do you optimize it? How do you do that? Well, I mean, I think that's why I showed some of the costs of, of events, is that there is some, you know, equipoise between our understanding of giving a bunch of medications that cost a lot to people who aren't going to have an event versus the cost in an infrequent and unpredictable group of patients who do have an event. And, you know, I think, you, you know, it's maybe for Stephen to comment on too as, uh, as a, a health delivery person is, you know, how do you reconcile uh, when the pharmacy budget is held by one group and they're charged with reducing costs by 25% over the next year. But the CEO is actually what, who cares about what things really cost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you need that. It comes back to that synergy and that operational buy-in so that the folks that at a higher level can say, I understand that you're, you live in this silo and are responsible for these dollars, but for our system it's beneficial. And so we're going to have that, that trade-off that's actually beneficial for a system in general. So it, it, it requires that higher degree of oversight and operational buy-in, otherwise you're right, you won't succeed. We, we run into the same issues for um, trying to get patients out of the lab. So uh, the, the floor that patients are supposed to go to has kind of their set budget and their, their operational flow, and as a result, they, they meet what they need to do, but it impacts upstream of them in terms of getting patients out of the lab and we have patients held. So we need that higher level of operational oversight to say, we're gonna allow this to run a little bit cost negative so that we can be cost beneficial in one aspect and, and help our overall health system. I mean, it becomes really complicated to think about all of these things. So for example, I'll give you an, a real world example from last week that I'm dealing with, which is uh, a hospital about 45 minutes away that is owned by our hospital wants to have an elective PCI program. They transfer about 150 PCIs to us. And so this is like great idea, right? It's great for patients. They don't have to transport all the ones that, you know, all these things. And uh, so what happens now, instead of getting transported up 45 minutes to us and having same day discharge maybe or discharge the next morning, they go to ICU because they're a new program right. and they need to learn and you know, it's so unsafe and all these things. So now you have somebody, 150 patients that are going to ICU for a day or two and staying in the hospital when they would have been discharged from home to, you know, from the cath lab uh, after a 45 minute transfer. And, Who's like in charge? And then all the variations of, well, that hospital is owned by our hospital, so what's the financial incentive there? And if it wasn't, what would that mean? And all of these things. And this is where we're like all tools within the larger, you know, machine. But we made it that way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you. Yeah. You're pointing out all the complexities, and especially if you've got each individual hospital is responsible for its own profits and loss. Um, they, they become, you know, the large system's a holding company, and as a result, um, you can have each individual hospital maybe is doing well, but if you were to, to kind of synergize efforts, you'd do much better. Um, but that requires a, a high degree of operational oversight and to understand those issues. Yeah. And, and when they create incentives so that the hospitals are actually competing with the health system as opposed to optimizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any questions from uh, the audience or comments? 
All right. Well, with that, I think this is a really fun uh, uh, session, and uh, thanks for joining us. Have a good rest of the meeting.